Yeah. Great. All right, so we are holding the Gimel of Aleph on the base. You said that was the that was the Ani eating his dinner in a house with the Kohen standing on his shoulders. And on Amir Aleph, we, we learned the Mishnah that said that according to Rabbi Yezer, the ending time for saying Rabbi Yishma is because he understands B'Shach, B'cha is when people, when people go to bed, that window closes uh, earlier in the evening when bedtime is over, and specifically at the end of the first Ashmurah, the end of the first watch. So, now in the Gimel and Aleph, the Gemara had said, well, <coughs> first, what does a watch it mean? Does it mean a third of the night or a quarter of the night? And either way, whatever it means, let him say what he means. Let him say three hours or four hours, because the night is divided to 12 hours, so a third of the night will be four hours, and a quarter of the night will be three hours. So the Gemara then said, no, he understands Rabbi Lezer's sheet that happens to be three, there are three watches in the night, so each watch is four hours, so if night began at six and ended at six the next morning, so then by 10 p.m. that's bedtime is over, and people must say Kriyashma by then. But the reason why, says the Gemara, he said it in this circuitous way of talking about an Ashmura instead of so many hours, it's to let you know that there's a signal down here on Earth that you can know when it happens. And the Lord of Rice, which says he actually holds that all three Ashmurot have some sign down here, a siman, a sign down here on planet Earth. And the first, the first watch, its simon is when the donkey brays. The second watch is when the dogs bark. The third watch is when uh, the baby nurses, the baby nurses from its mother, and the wife speaks with her husband. And the Gemara asks on that, well, wait a second, what do you mean? Are you talking about those those moments when the dogs are barking, whatever it is? Is that the the beginning of the watch, the end of the watch? Because either way, it doesn't make sense. Because if it's the beginning of each watch, you wouldn't need the first of the first, because that's when night falls. And if it's the end of the watch, you wouldn't need the last of the last, because that's when day breaks. So, like Morris says, no, it actually it actually means the the end of the first, the beginning of the third, and the middle of the middle. Or alternatively, to actually what it mean the end of each of the three watches, and if you'll say, well, why do you need an alarm clock to let you know that the end of the third watch has happened, and then the night's over, you could look out your window and see that, that there's dawn. The answer is people don't always you know, sleep with the, with the curtains open, and if you're in a dark room, you won't know. So as soon as you hear people uh, talking, because they're getting up, and David's nursing, so then it's time to get up and say Kriya Shema. That was the Sunya. The, the rush and understood from there, this is a very practical, halakhic story. The reason why Rabbi Eliezer is telling you that there are signs on here, so you can tap into them. And if, and I'll say if, because the way that the Shulchan Aruch Pasch did, like the Rosh, in uh, the very beginning, it's the, the second Sif, the second Allah in, in Shulchan Aruch and Arachim, and so it's in Simon Aleph Sif base, it says, basically says, if you want to get up in the night to cry out about the base of Mikdash, or the Chorban, uh, destroyed the base of Mishkor, the Gullus, the time to do it is when Hashem is also expressing his, you know, suffering over it, as the Gemara ended up saying in another b'risa that Hashem roars like a lion three times a night over the Beis HaMikdash and the Gullus. Um, so the Rush says, if you want to be getting up at night time to cry over the Beis HaMikdash, these signs are telling you when the time to do it is. And that's how the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, if you want to get up at night time to cry over the Beis HaMikdash, it's at the first third, the second third, and the final third of the night at the times to get up and cry over the Gullus and the Beis HaMikdash. That's the Shulchan Aruch Paskins. The Shulchan Aruch also quotes the Rosh, and says anyways, in the Lachim Gimel, it says anyways, every Yerei Shemaim, everyone takes him seriously, um, whatever Yerei Shemaim means literally, I don't know, it's, it's like a, whatever it means in the code word of the Shulchan Aruch, but people who take this stuff seriously, certainly, anyways, even if they're not getting up in the middle of the night to cry out with the base of Mikdash, they should still be um, Metzar, um, in pain, and Doeg, and be worried about, like, you know, what am I going to do about it, the fact that the, that the base of Mikdash is destroyed, and that applies to all of us anyways. I told her the Shla, who says we can fulfill this by calling the lock, the lack, the lack of a base of Mikdash by saying Al Naros Babel during the week in Shir Hamalos on uh, on Shabbos and Yom Tov. I'd come up. Eliezer had an interesting question, which I thought was a good question. I thought about it more. He, he pointed out that in the Halacha base, it says if you want to cry out over the destroyed base of Mikdash, and or the gullus, the third is not the time to do it. But the third halacha, like halacha gimel, said, anyways, every year a shemana should be doeg and meitzar over the korban, but no mention of the gullus. What's the difference? 
So I didn't really have a good answer yesterday, but I was thinking more about it. I, I think I thought I think the answer is I just this is <coughs> my mind made up conjecture on the inside. But I suspect what's going on is for most of Jewish history, right, you don't need to be a Yerush mind to be Mazar, to be suffering and worried about the Gullahs because you're suffering from it. The Pope, you're suffering from it. Jews are being chased from the pillar to post in every generation. There's, you know, pogroms and massacres and exiles and blood libels and who's white. So the suffering, the obvious evident misery that the Gullahs <laughs> presents us with doesn't require a Yerush mind to say, God, when will this be over? But as far as the base of Mikdash, not true. People think after 2,000 years, like, who needs it already? We simply managed to respond without it. And of course, that's not true. So that you should be concerned and worried and stressed over the fact you don't have it. I think that's perhaps an answer to your, to your question. The other question is, why is cr crying like a lion crying? OK, that's good. That's, that, that would be for today. But it's a good question. That's, so but he, we're not, we're not, we haven't taken anything at all symbolically. We haven't looked at anything symbolic. We looked at it purely halakhically, that there's something going on here to tell you just, it's very practical, very practical. The last thing we ended yesterday by saying was, although the Rosh says the third of the night, the Shavar Pasch is the third of the night, <coughs> um, the Mishabura Mishra brings down, that's well known in the Mishabura, that the Kabbalists, meaning from the Zohar and the Talmudim of the Rizal, say that's the wrong time of night to be crying out. The time to cry out is at Chatzos Alala Mamash, Tiku de Chatzos, the middle of the night. And they actually will point to our Gemara and say that the essential, and we have two answers about how to reconcile when the signs are. The essential answer is actually the one that says the first one, which says it's the middle of the middle. You need dogs to bark to know when the middle of midnight is, because that's very relevant um, to <coughs> to know when say tikkun chatzos. Otherwise, the question will be why would the morning itself not at all? What's the relevance of the middle of the night? Others answer, by the way, the non capitalist lands that we're probably going on its own will say you need to know midnight for things like when you can stop eating your kachim, etc. Or oh. okay, so that that's where we left off yesterday. Now. We had introduced for two days the idea of how we got it to work, so this code language, and then yesterday we learned that this piece in a very prosaic, halakhic way. But, <coughs> but there are many in the Farshim who see this in this Gemara either in addition to what we said, or perhaps, perhaps even contrary to what we said, that this is not a halakhic piece at all, or in addition to halakhic significance, it also is a like an agotic piece to tell us something else altogether. So what I want to do today with you is just to read the piece again through. We'll go slowly. We'll pluck out some of these ostensible symbols and other, and other nuances in the text, and then try to see how those Mephorshim understand the, um, like the symbolic significance, the agotic significance of this, of this, uh, this Gemara here. Um, I think where it starts from, I think where it starts from to, to argue that it it may not be, or sh perhaps even should not be taken literally, is because of two questions. The first question <coughs> is, what's your first name? I'm sorry. What's your team? Yeah, the donkey and the donkey. Yeah, what's, what's your first name? Your first name? Alan. Alan. So Alan Rubenstein asked a question yesterday, and, and today again, which is, is it really true that, like just, just a basic come on question, come on, is it really true that every night at the stroke of midnight, or at the second the watch the dogs are barking, at the end of the first watch the dogs are barking, is that really true? Is that really an effective time? I mean, certainly <coughs> babies wake up throughout the night, women speak to husbands throughout the night, presumably dogs bray throughout the night, and dogs bark throughout the night. So what kind of an alarm clock is this? Is it actually even true? And I would, so I think that's a reasonable question. Could be the answer is yes. Could be the answer is if you live in that time and that place, the top would be useful. Maybe. I don't know. But, but I would argue that it seems for the text itself, even without looking out or listening outside your windows, what happens, that perhaps it should be taken literally. And why do I say that? Because if, this is what I suggest, if dogs, this is, I didn't see someone say this. This is just me. I hope it's true. It, or at least this is my caution like more, if nothing else, um, to be taken literally. If it's really true that dogs barking are a useful sign for you to decide to see when the second watch is happening, so then how, how could there be an evil voice saying with two answers? It's a, next question, well, when is the dog barking, at the, at the end or the middle? So the answer that Marsh should say would be, well, it's a great alarm clock, so just be quiet, listen, and you want to snuff <coughs> quickly, you know, get a, get a, whatever, get a stopwatch or the equivalent, and find out for yourself. How can there be two versions of the story? Unless what you're saying is that dogs barking are not really a, a dependable stroke of midnight or stroke of two-thirds of the night's alarm clock, therefore there's no point in listening, 
it's simply a discussion of what is symbolic of or significant of in terms of what it's referring to. You hear that the kasha I would have? The, this, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just restate it. If dogs barking is really a useful sign for knowing when the second watch is happening, so how could there be two versions that it's either it's happening at midnight or happening at 2 a.m. On, on our clock that we throw yesterday? They just divide. They, they had simple. They could have made a water clock, or they could have used it. Someone could have made an experiment with an hourglass. They had such things. So just figured out once and for all: are the dogs barking at 12 or at 2? You'd solve the question. So therefore, that's a very strong question in my book that suggests that this isn't meant to be taken literally. <coughs> okay. Either way, even with or without that. They definitely do understand it in, in a non-literal way, also in a legotic way. And therefore, let's, let's learn it again, and we'll, let's, let's flag, <coughs> blur out, if you say, like, hey, wait, that looks like something that's, something that's a polar bear, so to speak. <laughs> so we're now in Daf Gimel and Aleph. We're starting, um, I guess we'll start just from line four, you know, just to get things going again. End of line four, Gimel and Aleph. It says, my kasav Rebbe Hazer. What does Rebbe Hazer hold? E kasav ha-shalosh m'shmaras ha if he holds the three watches, lema ad arba shelves. Let him say what he means. Four hours. He kasavar arba mishmaras havi alayla. If he says there are four quarters of watch the nights, lema ad shalosh shelves. Let him say a quarter of twelve, which is three hours. Let him say after three hours, your time is up. Gemara says no. La olim kasavar shalosh mishmaras havi alayla. He holds there are taka three watches, third, 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 maybe four hours each. V'ha kamash malan. But the whole point of the Mishnah's allusion is to teach us dike mishmaras barakia that just as there are these heavenly celestial <coughs> shifts that the angels take to do their singing. And there are three of them in the night, three different shifts. Vika Mishmaras Bahara, there are also some kind of uh, like watch. Could be that the word, by the way, the word for watch, because <coughs> a wristwatch is has its etymological origins in the night these watches, or the night watches, or some relation to watches. But in any case, that, that there are these watches that go on in the night time, they like to tell what's happening in terms of the timing upstairs also. The time, because here's the bright side. Rabbi Lezer Omer, Shalosh Mishmaras Havi Alayla, he holds our three watches in the night. Valkol Mishmar Mishmar, and on each Mishmar, now this you probably wouldn't bring out, but there are those who point out, this is strange, it should have said at, like, Bechol Mishmar Mishmar, what's this, like, on, on each on. Mishmar, it's a little strange, it's a strange use for preposition, like a, on or over each Mishmar, he's going to be doing something. It just doesn't make exact sense. So that's a question. Why is it va'al? So in any case, va'al kol mishmar, mishmar, and upon each and every of watch. Yosheh v'kadosh baruchu, Hashem sits, v'sho'eg ka'ari, and he roars like a lion. So that is, of course, also a little sense of a polar bear. Like, this is a clear simile, right? That's saying Hashem is roaring, whatever that's supposed to mean. We'll have to say, what does it mean Hashem roars? That's obviously metaphorical talk. Anthropomorphism, Hashem is not a lion, doesn't roar. And why? It could have said Hashem roars and says, and if you actually note, when the Pasik is read from Yirmiyah, there's no mention of lions. So you'll, look, you'll see it inside. It just says Hashem is Shoeg, Hashem roars. And although Shaga is, in sort of Sukkim, the verb that's tied into lion roaring, I don't know why it can't, why it can't be just the Stam, you know, roar. But what? here it's saying it's lion like roaring, which has to be explained. Why do they want to focus on lions? Here? Why sits anyway? Why sits? I don't answer that question, by the way. But a good, it's, it's a good question. I, don't, I won't really answer that question. Okay. Um, in any case, yeah. What's sitting? What's it mean sitting? Yeah, it could have just said that. Exactly right. Yeah. It, could have, it could have just as simply said, at each Mishmar Hashem roars. What's the right. sitting? I don't know the sitting. Unless maybe it's, you know, actually, you know what? You know what? Actually, maybe I do know because they point. To Midrashim an Eka, Eka, um, about the lion roaring and Taka sitting could be a reference also to sitting as in on the ground in mourning. Could be uh, another dimension. Shnei Mar, as the pasuk says in Yirmiya, Hashem Mar Mi Yishav. Remember, we're going to count three shagos, three roars that are going to be, like in a simple understanding, a reference to three mishmaros, right? But anyways, Hashem is roar, and so we count the word from the. the Lemma from the, the root Shoeg three times. Hashem memaram Yishag, Hashem roars from on high. Ma'on kasho yitem kolo. He gives a voice, which is, by the way, not a shaga, by the way, it's a voice, but he gives a voice from his, uh, his holy abode. Sho'og Yishag, two more shagots. He roars, he roars again, 
words for nothing, but this could be referring a drush on the Pasuk of Miriam for the three watches, al nevehu over his home, which is a reference to Beis Mikdash, as we'll see later on. Fine. So we have what's going on over there exactly, right? The sim and the davar, here we go, there is a sign for when the roaring is happening and the watches are happening. Uh, Mishmar Rishona, the first Mishmar, the Chamor, no air, the donkey breaks. So now donkey is understood by many to be a, like a polar bear, if you will. I should actually make a list of these on the board. It's a symbol of something. Shnia, the second, the Kalavim Tzuakim, the dogs are barking. And Shlishis, the third, the Tinok Yonak Mishdei Imo, the baby nurses from the mommy, the really it's Shdei Imo, is actually from the mommy's breast, which is like um, ostensibly superfluous. Okay, you could just say Yonak Mishdei Imo. The Isha Mishdei Imo, and the woman, the wife, speaks to her husband. Period. And, end of Bryson. Okay. Now, then they'll have a bit of a halakhic discussion about squaring away middles or thirds or whatever it is. So let's just write down some of these symbols we have, if you will. Okay, so the three watches we have, the first watch, we have the Chamor, that's a donkey, brain. Excuse me. The second, we have Colombian, the hunt, barking. And then we have like a, the, the child nursing, this is Tinoch. Yehuda. You think Yehuda? Good. King. You think King? Yeah. Good. Okay, good. So, so we have Yehuda. I don't think he was going to tie in, although I think Yehuda is having the same line symbol. But line as a symbol, this is maybe King. I think. I think that I suspect. I suspect. I'm forced to speak it out also like this. That the lion, the lion is essentially the loudest. The, not only is, it's a, like the king of the jungle, it's a king in the top of the pile, which is an obvious appropriate symbol for Hashem, as opposed to a, a howler monkey or something, right? We wouldn't say that about Hashem. So the lion symbolizes, of course, um, top of the of the pile. Gevura. Um like some sort of exactly, some sort of some sort of strength exactly, and and, and perhaps Gevura, if you know that concept, that the, if we have. Yet the person sh should be mitgaber uh, kari that a line symbolizes gavura, like uh, which is like sort of strength but self restraint type of strength. You can say, it. Yeah. and and uh, and lions are loud. Lions are the loud, essentially the loudest animals out there. You can hear a lion from five miles away. They're loud. The lion's roar is very loud. So we're saying that the Shem roars with some kind of regalness, like king, and that he is roaring. That's my else that I mind. Very, very loudly. Um, oh, and I'm with Gvura. With Gvura. That's some sort of restraint. I'll, I'll put those on the board. Because the same, there's no magic here. In other words, these are symbols which are relatively familiar to us. And <coughs> go, so there's something like kingship. That says king. That's something like we have Gvura. Gvura is quite a technical term, a technical term. 
but some sort of strength that implies I, I'm super empowered, but the power I'm exerting is to withhold myself back, you know what I mean? Hold myself back, and do what I would otherwise do because I'm in control. Like the bear Kari, the, the keyboard like the line. And we said loud, like very loud. Uh, roaring like a lion means roaring very, very loud. Very loudly, I guess. Fine. So, also, it strikes fear. Also, strikes fear. That's true. I don't know. Indeed, I think it is true. If you, you're out there in the bush and you hear a lion roar, that would be. Uh, it's a positive when a lion roars, who is in the prayer. Exactly. Exactly. Fear inducing. So I think, see the same kind of, maybe there are, maybe there are a thousand other legitimate Sukkim and Midrashic references that aren't on the board, perhaps, maybe not. But the, my point is, the same that by analogy, the same way when I said we're going to start learning more in the beginning, I said, although many sure I'm trying to make the Gemara seem so amazingly complex, the Torah so large and difficult and beautiful that you're sort of overawed by it, my agenda is the opposite. My agenda is to, to make Torah look very simple and easy and from Russia to every old Gilles Yaakov you can learn too. There's no magic in it. You know, it's just, I, I tell you, genius is thinking slowly, quickly. So we'll just think slowly, slowly, but it's open to all of us. So I want you also to realize at some level that the interpretation <coughs> of the Midrash here is also, there's no magic here. They're, they're, it's symbolic language which is borrowing on symbols which if you're familiar with like what's called rabbinic literature, although that phrase has a nasty connotation, but if you're familiar with Midrashim and other Psukim and other and other Gemaras and so on, all of a sudden, like Ari is associated in your mind with these things. Should be with these things. And and that's that's what Chazal are referencing here. So the way that it can be read, and some do read it, is it says like I'll read the, the line part first. So it says um, so I'll call Mishmar Mishmar on each Mishmar. Now on would mean like over and above as opposed to at. That's the word all there. So what's happening in each Mishmar? So Rashi told us it's Malachim singing. Malachim singing to Hashem. And Hashem roaring like a lion over and above the Mishmar saying that, so to speak, Hashem is not interested in hearing all this praise, whatever it is, that the Malachim want to give him, because, like, so to speak, as we'll see in the Gemara, the next, keep his mind for the next Gemara down the way, like, like, it's worthless to him. I don't need people singing my praises. If, anyways, I have got a base of Mikdash. That, that's what this is going. So he, so to speak, over roars, he roars, he outroars the chanting of all the Malachim in heaven, because he's not, he wants to overpower it and essentially say, like, I'm not listening to that because I'm currently in mourning over my base of Mikdash. So that, so you see that. That's the, I'm the boss, so to speak. I'm in control here as the king. I'm roaring super loud. I'll over all the Mishmar, the singing of the Mishmar. Perhaps as we will, as we, we saw it at the bottom. Remember the, the rice at the bottom, it said like, oh, what are the, I had to exile them because of their sins. I'll discuss it later on. But either way, there's certainly a message as the, the rush interpreted. It's every, Jew, every year, Shemang should be doeg, be worried, what am I going to do about it? Maybe that's your fear inducing. I'm, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm taking things that Portia really did say and just lining them up to things that you picked up. I, don't, I think that that's legitimate. That's what they're seeing too. That Hashem is, so to speak, roaring with some more roaring, say, this is no joke. This is, a, this is, a, this is bad news. That, you got, that we have got to base Midrash is catastrophic. Bad for me and bad for you. And therefore, I should be putting the fear of God into you that you better be. So I go made some, what are you going to do about it? And so on. Maybe that would then tie into a little shot. So all you can do about it is you can get up at midnight and try to do a tikkunim or whatever the story is. Fine, so that's the word of the army. Like a lion. And then we have three different roars. Okay? Um, we'll see later on. Those three roars may well be, if you remember that, we'll keep those roars in mind. When I get a worked out the text, I'll show what those three roars might be paralleling in a later in a later Risa that we saw already, but I'll get back to it. Now what's with these these three so I'm like dot dot dot. Now the main part of the Risa was these three simone donkeys. Dogs, women, babies. So again, let's let's talk for a second. What do you what does the word chamor 
bring anything, bring anything to mind in terms of your other adventures through absolutely through through. Uh, brings to mind the Arcada, brings to mind Bilam. So why does it bring, why does it bring to mind the Arcada? What's the connection because, to more Arcada? Because he left the, left the two men with the two boys with the... Uh, right, so he said, he said you're going to stay here right. with you guys, whoever the Na'ar, let's say it was right. the Shmaluer, yeah. the, the, those other than me and Yitzchak, we're doing, some, we're doing something that you're not party to and privy to. You, non whatever, are you are equated here with the chamor? You stay ah, here with the chamor. Ah, chamor. Okay. Ah. Yes. So now, what is so? So that's saying this, that this maybe it's not unlike Yehuda being equated with the, the the lion. These people are being equated with the donkey. Oh, good. That's a good. That is a, so what what is the donkey symbolizing? What's also, symbolizing? If, if you're not if that's you're right. not if you're not uh, if you don't. Um, Give Hashem you for the firstborn sheep, then you. Okay, good, good. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. The chamor comes up a lot, obviously. Like, that, right. So, so oh, the, exactly. This word chamor actually has this. It's this, etymologically the same as the word um, physicality, chomriut. The word chomriut means chomer is physicality. So this is really refer. Uh, uh, and but if you're gonna stay here with the chamor, that means. That we're doing something which is elevated nature. They didn't see the place. Remember, right? Avram saw what was going on, and they didn't see it. Avram understood that they are they're physical beings they're without like any sensitive to spiritual matters. So, like a donkey, you stay with the donkeys. I don't want to go to that classic over there. But Hamor is 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 a, is a always a reference to physicality. It's considered to be the most like physical and of, of animals and. Many, you'll see Hamor comes up a lot in many, many. Yeah, if you want, you want to go back one step to the, to the lion, you get up in the morning like a lion, which is what Avram did before right. the Akedah. Right, right. Good. Good. There's something, so, the, yeah, so Gvura is a, yeah, yeah, good. But so, it's also the first thing that Shabura opens up with. Just to, to get up like a lion. Right. That's, that's, yeah, a, that's a Gvura reference. The Gvura reference. I think what's the Gvura reference, I actually didn't say it before, but I'll say it now, just because you're harping on at the moment, Sorry. which is, no, it's okay, but I, I was going to say that, you, you're going to see in a minute that Hashem, so to speak, like, wants a base of Mikdash, right? And, and well, what Hashem wants, he could have, obviously, if he wants it, but he's, he is purposefully being the Gavera himself, and, and holding back, expressing Gura, and saying, like, for your good, so to speak, whatever it is, I'm, I'm despite the fact that I very much want the base of back functioning and the gulls be over, but you guys are forcing me to discipline you. That's cool. You're forcing me to withhold what I could do until you resolve your problems, which we'll see in the price later on. Do you see that? So that's the that's the Gvura angle, I think, of the line. The Chamor, yeah. This the um, is kind of right. That's, that's right. So that's a different Gemara. That's a different time. But in, 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 but indeed, that's the, that's the point. Something there is going on is that the Mashiach is somehow <coughs> being shalet over physicality. Exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Is one interpretation, but that's the idea. So chamor, when you see chamor, you you chazal means physicality. It's, they actually, the the words actually mean that chumriot. Chumriot means uh, same 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 chumriot, for example, or chomer. It's all, it's all the same. Chetnem reish is the is the shoresh is the root of the of the lemma, whatever it's called. The verb. It's a minor verb, so it's the root. Um, it is is a um, is physicality. So we're saying somehow the first <coughs> of the night is like the physicality time. We'll talk more about it in a second, but that's what we're getting at here. What about dogs barking? Dogs barking at midnight, what is that? Some dog Yishmaya? <laughs> I don't know, maybe, but, but that's again, that's not, that's like the etzim symbol. What? Can you do the first one? So yeah, so the, the Mepharshim all seems to see this as a very close <laughs> association with the midnight Events of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, but the Pasuk says explicitly that the Malach of Abbas ran around killing everybody, and the dogs weren't but the dogs weren't allowed to be barking against, I guess dogs were barking like crazy, but not at the Jews. They were not allowed to bark, but they didn't bark, they didn't wag a tongue at the Jews. So, Kalev Mir, I don't know what words to put here, because the Kalev can mean a lot of things. Kalev has its own symbolism, not for this minute, but here they seem to understand the Kalev midnight story is very associated with that. Um, <coughs> I'll call it Makat Bukharot, but it's again, it's not, it's not a story. <coughs> that it's a time of din. I, you know, I went to Hebrew. Uh, it's like 
killing the firstborn, and it's a time of din. Din also, a rather technical term, like Hashem doing justice. I mean, it has to be with Any relation to Kalev? Kalev probably is related to this. But again, this will be like a prime. Kalev is some primary. So Kalev, like Ari, has like multiple different implications. It seems from the before that I, that I saw, could be there's a thousand more I didn't see, um, they're focused on this this angle. This is the significance over here. Okay, Kalev are considered to be lowly creatures, and they're the pretty third in Avela too, and they're the ones that put off, you know, like, you know, they have their own, they have their own symbolic significance, but it, uh, I didn't see anything beyond that, so I'll, I'll cut it there. Okay, so let's, so now, what do you see, a tina biyon v'shtimo, a baby nursing, what do you suppose that is a reference to? This is, this is harder, sorry. Sort of, but the, not, not the, so what do you suppose the abstract phenomenon that there is of, that there's such thing as babies nursing is a parallel. This is quite a complicated topic, I think. May I'll speak about it at length in a moment. It's what, what's going to happen. You know, let me go back to it in a second. I'll, I'll talk about that in, in its own. I want to make white words. I have a lot to say on that topic. It's more complex than I do, more rich than I do, less familiar than I do. We'll talk about it. So let's skip for a second. And Isha Mr. Paris in Bala. Well, like, the most basic, most basic symbol. What's just in the abstract? What's happening? A tina biyunk shteimo means that you have. A baby getting nursed, that's right. So this, this is exactly a, a dependence getting nursed, a totally, totally dependent, dependence, dependent is getting nursed from, from its source, its mother. That, that's what that's what Tina Yonak is symbolic, right? The most it's basic, basic. Let's still figure out there's something funny here with this we're putting in the word, not just the mommy's nursing, but it's nursing from the shteimo and the word, which is like, seems like an extra symbol here. We'll have to figure out exactly. The breast has some symbolism, significant symbolism here, and as I'll let the cat the bag, I'll go back to it. It's even one of Hashem's names, so it's like a little complicated. Okay, well, I need a board more for that. And finally, the other, the other, other symbol, Hisham is a So, in, as you, I don't know if you're aware, or not aware, what woman and husband's muscle is always talking about, which would be in literature, talking about Hashem and the Jewish people, right? That, is that what you're saying? I don't know. Hashem, Hashem is considered to be the husband, and the Isha is like Knesset Yisrael, it's the collective. Knesset Yisrael really means like the congregation, I suppose, but it's a, another code word for the collective super soul of the Jewish people. Like we have a single soul as B'nai Yisrael, so like that soul of Yisrael had that. We'll get back, we'll talk about more of the levels of Nefesh and Hashem. The next one up, Achaya. Is yeah. synonymous with Knesset Israel. That's fancy catalyst to talk, but the point is that it means the shared, all of us, the, the, the soul, let's call it the collective super soul out of which all of our Jewish neshamas emanate, is called Knesset Israel. It's considered to be like Hashem's wife, Kilo. And that's something that's a reference to over here. But you see, you know, I'm sure you've seen, um, for example, if you ever learn anything of Shira Shira, for example, you right away see this husband wife things understood to be like the Jewish people as a whole and Hashem. So that's the where his Hashem's wife came from. There are other, I should speak out the obvious, there are other relationships we have with the Shem, like, you can have like a father-son relationship or a king-servant relationship, but there's also the highest of them is the the, you know, the husband-wife relationship, that love, yeah. It's not like a nice way of saying that they were having a relation. No, no, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that, as far as I know. That's okay. fine. As far as in, I, I didn't see anybody suggest that. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, what do you make literal sense? Because like in the halachic framework, yeah. it's the night time. This, this is actually a reference to that, ironically. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because it's, it's not the time. Daytime is not the time for that. It's nighttime, it's time for that. Now the day is coming, it's time to get up and do your thing. Right? So that's, so this is something like baby nursing is like get, getting some <coughs> getting sustenance. And I think it's a sustenance. T-E-N-A-N-C. Was it E-N? Yes. Like that? No, A. It's a sustain. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so whatever it is. Whatever it is, sustenance is the most for like a nine. No, no, what that says there. It's in the American. And Hashem is nursing the birthday bala is somehow like in the loosest, broadest terms that the Knesset Yisrael, the Jews collectively, Somehow communing, I'll just call it very communing or communicating, communing, communing with Hashem. Something like that. 
This is a, a, a symbol, but I'll elaborate on that more. So that's what the Mufarshim are seeing in this, th this kind of stuff, what they're seeing in the story here. In other words, that even if it's literally true, like the Marsha, Marsha is like your, typically the first go-to guy in terms of an explanation of a Midrash. I don't even necessarily know why he's in the back of the book. He's first, so he's, I guess, accessible, and he's pretty thorough. Some think of like the Enyako, but Enyako is a book on the shelf full of stuff. Later on, Marsha is Marsha. Marsha is like a classic go-to person in terms of Agatha. I guess he also has a heavy duty respect because Marsha was an Afro and has like um, a very heavy duty halachic component to his work. Also, he discusses this every Tosos and so. That's uh, my Harusa from once upon a time once said that Rabbi David Feinstein told him, who was his, his great uncle, that um, you don't understand a Tosos until you learn it with the Marsha. So the point is the Marsha like carries a lot of weight amongst. Lipish gang also, so maybe that's why he gets some sort of special like, first place in terms of the go-to guy for Midrashim. Either way, that's not my point. My point is, Marsha happens to say explicitly that this should be taken like literally, and it's true. Like, there's no surprise that the rush Paskin did and it has a significance. But in addition, this is going on also. This kind of thing going on also. So now there are different ways of understanding exactly the two basic ways that the commentaries understand what's going on here. I'll go with the less abstract first, because sort of on the board. That what's going on here is that, excuse the Marshall himself also, that the first part of the night is like dedicated to physicality, if you will. I'll explain more in a moment, just to give you a big picture. The second part of the night is dedicated, when I say dedicated, I mean the spiritual, is propitious, so the spiritual forces in play, or what's going on in the cosmos is tied in to physicality, the first third, then din, like kalavim, in the second third, and in the third third already is now like the time for like Hashem to now bestow nourishment and connect to us. That kind of prayer. Marshari speaks out straight away that there are three parts of the soul. Um, you have your lowest part called your nefesh, which is like your life force. I don't know if I can speak each day people day long year or whatever, day, day long year. So I don't like get too bogged down. And I don't want to be too superficial, but I want to make sure at least understand the words I'm saying. So there's the lowest part of your soul, which is your nefesh. It's your life force. Even an animal has a nefesh. It seems that a person, it seems that, that, that a person has two the nefesh has two aspects in a human being: the nefesh bahamit, the animal soul, the life force that every cow has, and the nefesh elokit, which I don't know exactly the dynamics of, but it's like the spiritual part, which is sort of unique to human beings. I guess that's just an appropriate end of the chain. There I go in the end of the topic. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take, even though I'm not sure how universal this topic will be for our Gemara's here, at least let me say it's worthwhile talking about once, once why not. So, okay, so like, I'm taking a step back. Rechaim Vital, we'll go with him for a moment, who is a leading, leading catalyst and a student from the Rizal. So he gave a mushal like this. I'll go with his mushal, but we'll only get us going here. He wants to give a muscle that of uh, to understand the human soul as um, like a glass blower. You ever seen a glass blower? This big hot molten glass, and if you want to make it into a vase, so you or whatever, so you obviously can't have direct contact with it. What happens is they put like a straw, and then the glass blower blows with the straw and inflates this vessel, and then he makes a plea out of it. So he uh, he uses that as a metaphor for understanding how. The relationship between like us and our soul and Hashem. Like this, you got a few parts. You have a glass blower who blows through the tube, then the, the wind goes through the tube into the kli, and then it like the glass vessel, and it fills up with air and it takes it, it takes its shape. So he understands that the, the last step in the process, when the air fills into the glass container, that is that's like in his he's just giving a metaphor to understand. That's the nefesh. The nefesh fills and, so to speak, he'll give shape to this kli. The actual piece of glass is chomer, it's physical, that's your body, your physical person. But imbuing your body with it, as the Pasuk says, the life force, you alive, and maybe, for all I know, I've never got this clear. And I've asked lots of people. For all I know, and maybe it's not true, but for all I know, the nefesh Bahamas, the actual nefesh animal part, the life force, is totally biochemical, for all I know. For all I know. 
Maybe that's like a totally dead wrong, but I cannot. Maybe it's even biochemical. Maybe. So it's, it's, it's embedded in the blood. Not the nephesh, not the nephesh of keys for sure not. There's something higher too, but the, in any case, the life force could be just a biochemical phenomenon. I, I don't know. In any case, so the nephesh is at the bottom, <laughs> bottom level, the most distant from the glass blower, the blower is Hashem, of course, <laughs> and where the vessel that Hashem is giving form to and imbuing us with our thing, our life, or whatever it is, that's the air pocket, is the nephesh. That's why, you know, the word nephesh actually means, like you would say, Kiddush on Friday nights, you say, Hashem on Shabbos, Vayina Fash, which means Hashem, like, came to rest. But it doesn't mean rest in the, like, take a nap sense. That's other words, like, our resting is assist. Vayina Fash means to, like, to, like, descend upon as it comes to rest. It come, the spaceship comes to rest on planet Earth, Vayina Fash. So he says that's the same idea. When this flow of energy or breath, whatever you call it, from Hashem, Starts out in the Shem side of things, ends up at some point it comes to a, to, a, to an end, and it swirls and comes to a stop somewhere. But as this flow that comes down from the glass we're up on high, so to speak, down to the vessel down below, it's the ending point. That's the the nefesh that it comes to rest inside of us. This, there could be because other Michelin too might be more intuitive. I find at least in this regard, I'll give you a, um, a concurrent muscle, Just without being more complicated, I think it's too abstract otherwise. If you think. It's a different mushroom. If you imagine that the mushroom is Hashem is like a source of light and shining out into the cosmos, think like that for a second, like think of a flashlight or those laser pointers. So what happens is, like you have this laser pointer light that's emanating and the light goes through space forever and ever and ever and ever and ever on great distance, perhaps passing through many layers, and whatever. At some point, <coughs> if, you, if you've ever been in a clear night and you see the kid pointing the laser pointers, or out of, maybe you see your kid pointing out, out of the window, so you actually don't see the laser pointer in, in, the, in the air. What happens is at some point it comes into it's like it comes to rest on something physical, and that's when like think there's a green dot. You understand? There's no you don't see a green beam across the room, unless it's very dusty, but that's not what I'm talking about. You, there's the light over there, some of this is invisible, you know, transmission going through whatever it goes through, and at some point it comes to rest on, when it hits home when it hits physicality, and then ta-da, the green circle appears. So I'm gonna go back to my muscle of the glass door in a minute, but just to give this parallel mushrooms maybe a little more intuitive. The Shem is emitting this light, and again, if it goes wherever it goes, at some point it comes to rest on something when the, the transfer is over. There's no further transfer, it stops when it reaches the whole not see of the world of like physicality and action. It's it is, it's bedrock, so to speak, bedrock physicality. And if you think about it for a second, if I ask you what is that green circle in the wall made out of, you would tell me what? Let's say comprise them. Light. Light. And that's the light. And also the green circle is only a green circle because it's also made of color. Of wall. Oh. Are, you, are you with me? Until 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 it hit the wall, it was just this like transmission that was invisible. But it became a green circle, all of a sudden, because it's now had the light has now sort of combined with whatever, they can contact with the wall, and I have wall plus light equals green circle. <laughs> So we're somewhat, we are each our own little green circle, so to speak. That there's a piece of meat called me, here it is, you know, in front of you. And and uh, there's a source of light, Hashem, and when the Hashem's emanation of his light shines down into this piece of meat, ta-da, the meat plus light equals this body plus soul, and here, here I am. And at some point, I guess the flow will stop, and the the, the light won't shine into this particular piece of meat anymore, at which point, so the, lo the light will be where it is, up in the flashlight in the sky, so to speak, and the meat will still be here where it always was, because they're not connected anymore now, I'm just a dead, it's just a corpse, I'm right? just not a, not a living person at all anymore. The netfish is whatever the netfish is doing, whatever, and the, the bus are the meat, the meat is, but they're not connected anymore, and they'll be no longer, a, they'll just be a piece of wall. The green light will be over there, and the wall will be over here, they're not connected. So I mean, that was maybe a more useful metaphor, I think, than glass blowing for us, but we'll go back to glass floor. He says, Hashem is emanating this breath out of him, and it's coming down this chain, and eventually he comes to us when it being a fush and some clee, the clee is a piece of meat, the glass, and there's a nephesh that gives it its, I don't know, its shape and its form and defines it. What defines the clee is a particular way the air can rest inside of it. So that's the nephesh, the lowest part, that's a physical world, and it lives here in our blood. I told you, maybe even biochemical, at least that the nephesh bombs. That, that lowly, <coughs> biochemical, as opposed to something totally real thing. Then there's a step back from there, in other words, like back, we're cursing back from the piece of glass to back to the glass blower. 
we're going to try to chain it up. The way that the catalysts understand it, there's like um, like four major um, OMO. We'll call them universes, but I don't know if that makes anything sense in real English. They're, they're stages of, of existence, <coughs> of ca causality that shift that chain down from where Hashem is, and like, do, 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 like, and it's, through that, I call them filters almost. Filters of the light passing through as they get weaker and weaker and weaker, so eventually it gets down to this layer. We're in the bottom layer where our bodies exist and everything physical exists. It's called Olam HaAsiyah, the world of action. That means there are no tables where the angels live or where your <coughs> soul lives. Okay, in the Tables only exist in this world and Nefesh operates in this world. There's a step up from that, okay? It's called Olam HaYitzira, just a word that <coughs> means the world of formation. You can, you can, these words are coming from if you read Bereshit's prophets, Hashem's created in the world, you will see, like, there's, sometimes things are Asa, gone and finished, that's talking about physical phenomena. Then there's things are being Yotzer, that's talking about something that's actually a step up of causality, a non-physical thing. There's some things are being, like, Nivra Bore, which is a higher step up yet, which we're not talking about at the moment. In any case, this is very complicated, I know, I was not too bad. But, da 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 Just follow introductions to the Marsha, but I guess it's so like, basic and fundamental to Jewish Hashkava. These ideas are very weird to you, they're familiar. So maybe it's good to discuss it for once. So it's something like this. Okay, I don't know. Imagine it. So, I got it. So this bottom layer over here is the Olam Hasiya, the world of action. And in our little chain, glass plum, whatever it is, here's where that fish lives. Here's where that fish lives, and here's where your body lives. Okay. The remarkable thing about the Olamas, the world of action, is where it's where soul and the spiritual and material come into impact. So the step up is called the Ruach. Ruach. Ruach, maybe you've heard that term. Next step up, the Ruach. That means, so what does Ruach mean? Wind. Literally, literally does mean wind. Or spirit. 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 Right, it means either or, or both, whatever it is. So what's going on here is what connects to the, here's our, our vessel down here, our little cleat, a little glass bottle. So what's, where is its source of air coming from? There's a little tube, right? A little tube. And this tube has a, is a conduit for air passing through. Wind, if you're familiar with it, what, what actually, what is wind? What's the difference between wind and air? Movement of oxygen. Movement. Movement, Movement. that's exactly right. That's, it's the same thing. Wind is just, <clears throat> you've got air, and we've got some kinetic energy, and the air is on the go, it feels like wind. That's all it is, it's just part of it's moving. So the Ruach is considered to be like quite a, this, this world, the Olam is considered to be quite a, an active place. Olam Yitzira, formation. These are just silly words, I mean, whatever, but they are what they are. Um, so there's a level up called the Ruach, which is the flow as it comes on down from the glass blower or the source of light into the, into the cleat. And it's divorced, get this, it's quite important to realize in the muscle, it's some intermediary. It's, it's, no, it's neither connected to the <coughs> lead, except that I guess it's a very connected point, it's its own world, nor is it connected to the blower, right? It's its own little world itself. But it's a conduit between the two, that's quite important. In other words, there's this motion, this dynamic system, which links what I do down here to what it, to up there, what happens up there, and down to me. <coughs> that transmission of forces up and back down again really happen in this, in this world, and, they, and that's why it's considered like a, 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 a wind. <coughs> You'll see, if you look at the like, Yitzhak or something, you start looking at the Navi, you talk about storm winds and so on, you see they're, they're encountering a lot of activity, spiritual activity over here. This is, if you want to think of the world of angels, where angels do the thing, we talk about the angels being kind of um, it's meant for like, like um, nerve, nerve impulses. This is the world of angels. This is where angels the cla your class, you think of Allah and you should think of what's going on here. In other words, there's something happening above here, the transmission down to us, to our world, is transmitted through these Allah. 
There are other spiritual forces that inhabit higher up, but we can think of this the angel. So you got a ruach over here, which is your your um, your spirit, if you will. I don't know what that means, it means to you, but um, it, it's what gives force to your nefesh. Many times in the schematic, you'll see that this the nefesh is is like um, associated with action for obvious reasons, right? And the the level of ruach is very often times associated with emotion <coughs> or speech, actually. With an A, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no it's, e, it's two E's. E's. Speech. E's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Speech, that'd be good. Speech, that'd be good. Speech, that'd be good. I don't know why. Okay. Um, so, so to speak, if you want to, like, be mitake in your nefesh, we have to do right action <coughs> mitzvahs. That's our life mitzvahs. But there are certain heavy-duty mitzvahs that are, that are tikkunim for the ruach, which flow down, which is why, I'm sure you're familiar, they say things like, you know, the most heavy-duty mitzvah of all, sometimes people say, is, is um, Lashon Hara, for example, or Kriya Shema, we're talking about. These are, these are, these are half, forget Kriya Shema, but put that aside for a second. But let's talk Lashon Hara. So the way your speech has a tremendous impact, because it's considered to be, if you do bad speech, Lashon Hara, or Lishna Bisha, as it's called in, in, uh, in Aramaic, like bad, evil tongue, here's Lashon Hara, something like that. Um, you're essentially you're, like, you're polluting everything. The whole, the, you know, this, the, the, the primary conduit gets polluted because you're ruining the, the ruach party. Hence, when you speak, the, the way that you do speech is with a promotion of wind from your vocal cords and so on. That's what the body is built. The body is here, and then this is the speech apparatus. So, in any case, this is how we do the time. So, the next step up of your of your soul as it chains up to. Hashem, let's call it. Um, that's a good thing to call it. Um, is your is your ruach, which feeds the, the nefesh, and there's this air feed down, like they're the two. It's going into the glass vessel, um, and it's a wind. It's a flow of air, a flow of air, but quite quite divorced from the blower. Right? It's divorced. It's a wind. In other words, the next step up is your neshama. By the way, some usually. This whole structure is referred to as anashama, the anashama, but actually anashama is a particular part. It's this part. It's the part that lives in something called Olam Abriya, the world of creation. Um, and in, that's where your anashama lives and does its thing. The word anashama actually literally means, oh my gosh, we got it. Then the word anashama, the word anashama means Breath, breath. Because that is like the breath of Hashem, or in this case, the glass blower. But it's, there's a reason why Hashem, that the Rav Chaim Tal chose that. This means breath. And this is like, so to speak, like the breath of Hashem. The breath is something much more intimate. Between, you can't compare a breath to a wind, right? What's the difference? The wind, the breath, it's just detached. It's just some abstract movement. It's a movement. But someone breathing down your neck is like a person being. It's personal. It's, a per it's personal, that's right, it's personal. Because that's connected, like this side, so to speak, is the guy's blower's mouth, if you know what I mean. It's personal. So the Nisham is considered to be the place at which we, so to speak, connect back to Hashem more directly, whatever that means. It's a piece of Hashem. It's not actually Hashem, Hashem is a pieces. But if you think of the metaphor, what gives you your life is your breath and your oxygen in your body. If you're giving out your air, that's, something, that's a very, that was what was keeping your body alive a moment ago. Your, your breath is like a very intimate, it's, Connection to you was a part was a part of you, as opposed to the ruach, which is just in the tomb. So that's your the shama. That's connected, like in the system with with thought, thought, right? And that's why, like the, the uber duper, super duper mitzvah in Jewish the Jewish hierarchy is the Talmud Torah, right? Because that's that was first you have to <coughs> understand and think properly and then it'll chain down properly, right? That's why human being is structured that does the body and the clay mass of the action and the speech apparatus and finally on top, ruling it all, is the is the brain. That's the, the thought source, which governs, should govern where everything goes, and you want to not pollute that to come down. Hence the Kavoda Zora is like the, the bad bad news perversion of of this whole system as it comes down. So he's gonna so now that long introduction, and I guess I you know what the <coughs> My exactly no seconds here. I'll put, there's another step up here called the Chaya, 
and call this the Knesset's role. We'll call it this Sinas of Knesset's role, the, the collective soul that we're all sharing. Each of our little neshamas is emerging out of this one shared soul that we have on here that's connected to will and what it's worth. But anyways, not for now. I guess we're out of time. Ratzo. Um, and that's sort of the world up above the actual silos, which means proximity to Hashem. In any case, we'll, we'll stop over here um, and we're out of time. And tomorrow, we will, we will uh, see how the, the Marsha understood that we're talking about donkeys and dogs and each of us a person like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.